It is a pleasure to introduce today's webinar guest, Radhika Kosla, who is research director of the Oxford India Center for Sustainable Development and a research fellow at Somerville College. She's also a senior research at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment, the School of Geography and the Environment, all at Oxford University. She works on examining the productive tensions between urban transitions, energy services, consumption, and climate change, all with a focus on developing country cities. She's the lead researcher on the Oxford Martin Program on the Future of Cooling, a contributing author to the sixth IPCC report, and the lead author to the recent United Nations Environment Program Emissions Gap Report. It is a pleasure to have you with us, Radhika. Welcome. Thank you for all the meetings that we've had and the, the conversations that they've brought up and these meetings that have asked us to be bold in some of the questions that, that we choose to ask. And, and I'm very grateful for that space that, uh, that you provided. I'd, I'd like to speak today about some of the issues that I'm still working out and particularly to reflect on the tensions that I grapple with in my work. So thank you for being part of this model with me as we, as we try to work our way through it. Now, I'd like to start by placing our current predicament in the arc of planetary history. And this is a graph that many of us have seen to the point of almost somewhat being untouched by it. Um, there's, let me use this figure as a way to remind us then that if we look back at the history of the earth 400,000 years, way before humans lived on the earth, we see these cycles of increased and reduced carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And when we look at this graph, we see that about a thousand years ago, something very different starts happening. And we see that in this amplified box where the level of CO2 starts rising exponentially. As of two days ago, um, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere was almost 417 parts per million, something that we've never seen before. Now, the reason why carbon dioxide is important is because it is it causes warming that we don't just see today, but because it is an it is a greenhouse gas that lives in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. And so once it's put into the atmosphere, it stays and it's sort of agnostic to the time scale of when it arrived. Now, this particular property of carbon dioxide brings us to the first and potentially the most profound tension and ethical question that has characterized our climate conversation, which is how do we consider and take responsibility for our role in the arc of planetary time and space? I'd like to walk us through a few figures that try and answer this question. Now, in, in talking about who is responsible, the first way we could try and answer this question is to look at annual emitters. And that is to look at countries that produce carbon dioxide emissions and that do so at an annual basis and see how much each of the, the big emitters emit every year. And if you look back from 1800 to about now, you can see the variation in different countries in their emissions and see that countries, for instance, China in, 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 in most recently is the largest emitter that we have followed by the United States, followed by the EU and then by India. And these are all countries that at an, at, at an annual level are emitting the largest amount of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. And there is a way then to look at this graph and say that responsibility for the levels of carbon dioxide concentration that we're seeing in the atmosphere today lie with these nations, lie with the people in these nations. There is another way though to look at responsibility and that is to look at cumulative emitters. Now, the reason why cumulative emitters is important is going back to that property of, of this greenhouse gas which is that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. It stays for hundreds of years and it keeps creating warming as long as it stays. And if we look at the history of different nations and how long they've had uh, emissions ongoing for, we see a very different pattern here. 
we see the United States come up on top with the EU following and then with China, Russia, and the United Kingdom showing the, the, the sort of trajectory and the, the volume in some sense of the emissions that they have caused over the, the, the last many decades, um, indeed hundreds of years. And there is a different way then to say that responsibility could be allocated on the basis of these different numbers. Now there is yet one more way to think about responsibility and that is to consider emissions per person. And when we look here, we look at within each of these countries, how much carbon dioxide space, so as to speak within the atmosphere is allocated per person. And then some of the big numbers or the big emitters that we see, particularly India and China have a much smaller role to play because actually given the populations of these regions, the emissions per capita are significantly lower than they would be if we looked at responsibility from a cumulative or an annual emissions point of view. Now, given these conditions, how do we begin to allocate and take responsibility? This is a question that I've struggled with for a long time and the history of the negotiations of the last 25 years uh, within the UNFCCC, within the climate arena, have been unable to answer that to fully or, or, um, or to the best that they could. And, and I, I would go far, so far as to say that we've been unsuccessful in answering this question. The Paris Agreement sidesteps this issue and instead it places all countries at the same register, doing away with that initial categorization of developed and developing countries. But the profundity of this question remains and the profundity of asking who should take onus should it be the countries that grew with their industries and economies to create the sort of capital order that we are embedded in today, which has resulted in so many comforts that we enjoy, energy for almost every dimension of quality of life, healthcare, food systems, technology, the ability to speak to each other as we do today, or other parts of the world and its people where advancements have not yet taken place with the same relative speed or scale, but where there is the sort of rightful belief and demand for the same quality of life, at least to the extent that it is perceived. And in terms of sort of, you know, posing this tension then, I'd like to ask, you know, where, how do we construe justice under these conditions? One that is fair, not just intergenerationally, but also in the current moment and also spatially. And how do we answer the question of not only how can we be good ancestors, but also to respond to the question of we have, of have we had good ancestors? I'd like to move now to the second tension that again is um, sort of plagues the way that I, I think about climate change and the Anthropocene. And that is the tension between different disciplinary approaches, particularly to the idea of how climate change can be solved. Now, what I have here in terms of the figure is um, it's, it's a really important graph from the IPCC 1.5 degree report. And it shows us the four different ways in which we could arrive at our target temperature goal, which is 1.5 degrees um, of, of warming and the ways in which it's possible to do this or, or the pathways with which we can do this. And if you look at these, these four images, what we see is that for the most part, there's, um, there are two ways to get to this 1.5 degree target. Either we use reduce CO2 emissions from fossil fuels, industry, land use and change, or we remove CO2 emissions from using negative emission technologies or by storing CO2 in soils and plants. Now, in these four different pathways or these four different figures, there is only one, which is the one on the top left, where you don't see the bright red. And the bright red is technology for negative emissions. And, and what's interesting here is that we, that, the, that our modeling community, our scientific community, which many of us are part of, contribute to, um, have made it very clear that of the four ways to get to our temperature target, we can only do that 
in, in by using negative technologies except for one scenario. And in that one scenario where we're not using negative emission technologies, we are reducing energy demand drastically. Now, again, the, the, you know, the sort of the tension for me here is that we have so easily moved into embracing these three different scenarios that actually use negative emission technologies without really paying full attention to the one where we could change our lifestyles and achieve that 1.5 degree warming. Now it's very clear that you know, climate change is this complex super wicked problem. It, is require, it requires interrelated disciplines, whether they're economic, political, social, or biophysical, and we need to reduce our CO2 emissions to zero. Yet, are we really looking at this question seriously enough to be able to think of the ways in which we could change our lifestyle to be able to achieve those targets instead of relying solely on these technological options without really asking and embracing the messiness of how these technologies will get embedded into our everyday life or the political economy of doing so. I want to remind us that currently we are on track to reaching this 1.5 degree target in the next 10 to 20 years. We are now in a world where mean, mean surface area, a mean surface temperature is 1.18 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial world in terms of warming. And if we continue down this current path, we will reach this 1.5 degree warming between 2030 and 2050. And so while we sort of grapple with these negative emission technologies, which still do not exist, which still or do not exist to scale um, and are not financially viable, where we're still we're unable to sort of reflect on using our lifestyles and our and our the changes we could make in our behaviors today to be able to reach our 1.5 degree target. And as we as we try and you know find ways to embrace these negative emission technologies, extreme weather events continue to rise and 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 every time there's a you know there's a talk that i end up doing the the number of extreme weather events the number of challenges that societies are facing around the world there there are just new images to share and and there seems to be this sort of you know um uh, uh, almost an indifference between how we construct this in our modeling scenarios and in the reality that unfolds on the ground. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to take a little bit of a closer look at that question of everyday practices, routines, and lifestyles, and ask the question that if we were, if we had to think about reducing demand, which is the, you know, the, the one scenario in our IPCC reports, which allows us to get to our temperature targets without, without making very dramatic changes to our technologies, how would we get there? So what's interesting is that approximately two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions are connected to households. So that's everyday life that you and I lead and changes to lifestyles are necessary to emission reduction. Indeed, mobility, the residential and our food each contributes 20% to global lifestyle emissions. So those three sectors actually comprise a very large amount of emissions. And there are ways in which each of those can be tackled so that we reduce those emissions and, and change our contributions to addressing this problem. Now, one of the, the sort of easiest and yet hardest ways to do this is to think about transitions in terms of um, structural lock-ins in the economy. And what I mean by that is how we build our economy, how we build the structure of cities really determines the way that solutions get shaped in each of these three sectors. So whether it is in mobility, whether it is in residential, or whether it is in our food systems, the structure of cities is actually really important in determining that solution space. And again, what's, what's really sort of striking here is that cities occupy about 0.5% of the Earth's surface, but it's in that very small amount that so much of our energy consumption patterns get set 
And this is a, a, a sort of real space in thinking about mobility, residential, and food that we can make shifts that allow us to, to, to change the order of, of the emissions patterns that we're seeing. Now, why we do this, this shift in, um, you know, within these structures, there's a, there's a way in which we can start categorizing how these shifts can happen. And I'd like to categorize our lifestyle shifts in three different ways. And I'd like to focus on the interrelationship between the individual and systemic change, because individual choices operate within broader contexts that enable or constrain action. So let's start by looking at the personal. And you know, within individual choice, there, is, there are ways in which behavior change can happen. And this can be, for instance, around flying less or eating less meat. And it's often a function of the knowledge and information we have of our attitudes and awareness. But then there's a second way in which lifestyle shifts happen, and that is related to our social. So it's sort of beyond the individual and, and speaks to our larger social context. And here there's a real influence that we see of our peers and of the norms that exist within, um, within our societies and the influence that we have on each other. We see that in the Fridays for Future movement, we see it at um, you know, the neighborhood effects in terms of uptakes of solar rooftops. And it's a different sort of change that, um, and, and in, in our behaviors that happens because of our relationship to each other within society. And the third way in which these lifestyle shifts happen is actually structural. It's sort of beyond the, the scope of what an individual can do, but it's actually related to the role of policy and the role of infrastructure. For example, is there public transportation available? Do I need to own a car? I mean, it's only if there is public transportation available that I'm likely to not own a car. And, and that choice is often determined by something that is structural beyond a choice that I would make as an individual. Similarly, are there vegetarian options available? Could I take a train instead of a flight? These are all different structural ways in which how cities are built, how the built environment is structured that allows us to make the choices we need to, but also shapes the solution space to be able to get to the sort of lifestyle changes that we that we need. And as we work our way through these very different approaches of modeling and lifestyle change, there remains the question of whether the scale and scope of our human response can be of the level that the models and the technologies that we create demand. Now, finally, I'd like to sort of get to this third tension, which is how do we provide energy services while protecting the environment? Our future is being framed by the need for more energy, but the provision of more energy with much fewer emissions. And that demand is one that we have not made yet of, of ourselves as a society. We know that, that radical reductions are required in our fossil fuel emissions to stabilize the climate, but at the same time, energy use is rising around the world, fossil fuels provide energy security to many, many that underpins modern life. And affordable access to energy is a priority for development. Now, in 2014, more than 3 billion people, that's about half of the world's population, had no access to clean fuels for cooking. This shifted in the four years that followed. and. In 2018, for the first time, the global population without access to electricity dropped to below 1 billion. And that happened at the cost of the environment because most of, um, most of these, these emissions and the provision of this energy came from fossil fuels. And the demand we're making now is to be able to provide both development and quality of life and address climate change together. And that particular tension is one that, again, is, is one that hasn't really been worked out. And instead, we're, we're in a world where we're actually pitting climate change and development against in each other in many conversations. And I'm curious about how that tension actually shapes our environmental response and how does it shape our relationship with nature. Um, 
I, I'll give an example of of cooling um, because this is it, this is an area that I've been doing a lot of work in, but it's also a fascinating area because it's not one that we think about often. So the prediction is that 10 new air conditioners will be sold every second for the next 30 years. And this is a global number. So every second, an equivalent of 10 new air conditioners will be sold. The reason for this is that at the moment, a billion people face immediate risks from the lack of cooling. And these are health risks, these are productivity risks, they're socioeconomic risks. And these risks are going to grow as extreme weather events grow. Um, the tragedy is that the more we use cooling, particularly through air conditioners, the, the warmer it gets in terms of feedback loops because air conditioners release greenhouse gases and, and they you know, sort of go on to make the earth warmer requiring more cooling. Um, the figure here shows us that the forecast by the end of the century is that the energy we will need for air conditioning is going to outweigh that that we need from heating. And by 2050, cooling, the cooling demand will be equivalent to that of the entire energy that is used by the US, Europe, and Japan today. Now, this demand for cooling is shaped by ideas of modernity. Lee Kuan Yew said um, very early on that air conditioning changed the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. But the, the juxtaposition of this, of you know, the, the need for cooling, the provision of energy for quality of life, the need for development in a way that risks the environment, that risks the, and, and not just the, the local environment, but the global environment, um, sets up this dichotomy of, of a world where there are synergies and trade-offs. Um, but I want to ask what is lost in, in setting up of that dichotomy and how do we narrow that gap? How do we change this contra construct where development and climate change are pitted against each other um, to be able to provide something that is very fundamental to, to all and not to just a few. So, you know, I'm gonna end here because I really want to speak, uh, speak with you about all of these things, but I'd like to end with a little bit of hope perhaps and, um, talk about socio-technical tipping points because, you know, in the way that we're addressing the climate problem, in the way that we're working through these questions of development, of justice, and of interdisciplinarity, there can be nonlinear responses. And we've had nonlinear responses in the past. And, and I'll give an example here that's not an environmental uh, example, but it's one that shows us that, you know, the world is possible, it, it is possible to shift things around sometimes very quickly. So this is Easter Day Parade on Fifth Avenue. And we see here in 1900 that that avenue is, you know, it's full of horses um, pulling various carts and, and people. And that is the primary mode of transportation. And then when we look at that same avenue 13 years later, um, there's been a complete shift and actually there's you know cars are used as a way for transportation and uh, for you know for movement and mobility and so perhaps there is a there is room um for for us to to think about how and where these socio-technical tipping points exist that incorporate the you know the different disciplinary approaches allow us to move a little bit closer towards um, questions of justice, but also meet development needs. And, and you know, the, the phrase that I really like or the, or the problem that Mike Hume posed in how he thinks about climate change that I'd like to end with is, is the quote that climate change is not so much a discrete problem to be solved as it is a condition under which human beings are to make choices about the way we live and govern ourselves. So I'll stop there and I, I really look forward to talking to you about each of these. All right. Thank you so much, Radhika. You've put a number of very important issues on the table for us to discuss. So I like very much the framing that you make to, to have us think about where we don't pit development against 
climate justice, for instance. I remember being in a conversation once with an Indian colleague who was quite lamenting the fact that American environmentalists keep, keep saying that we need to you know, drastically change our lifestyle. And, and he was saying that that takes hope away from people in developing countries if you're going to cut energy production when it's precisely energy production that is necessary to lift these societies out of conditions of, of poverty. So I'd, I'd like you to think a little bit about how you know, some people would suppose that if you think just about the example of air conditioning, which I think is a really powerful one, given the kinds of heating projections that, that we see coming in the future and that you've told me about in New Delhi in the summer, for instance, right, where it's so hot. Couldn't one say that the answer is just technological, that what we do is we, we sort of leapfrog fossil fuel energy electricity production and just go straight to solar? And then we, we solve the problem because India gets so much sunshine, solar power would just solve the problem. Is that, is that short-sighted in your view to think that there's a technological fix to this? Yeah, so Norman, can you, can you just elaborate on that a little bit more because I, and then, and then I'm gonna- I'll, I'll Yeah, so on the one hand, I, I, I fully agree that it's a mistake to think that we should stop development as a way of addressing climate change and thereby leave hundreds of millions of people in conditions of poverty and a, and a substandard quality of life. And so if we use air conditioning as, as our example, couldn't we say that there's a technological solution, which is simply to install solar power in India at tremendous amounts. And that way we can have all the air conditioning that we need in the world to address this very real life issue about heat conditions. Right. I, I think that's, you know, technological solutions like that exist. And the hope is to be able to uh, deploy them at scale, but doing that is not straightforward. And, and you know, so there are, there are two things that play here. One is speed, the speed at which the uptake of certain energy consuming technologies takes place. The speed at which we're in this example, using air conditioning, right? 10 new air conditioners every second. And the speed of the alternative that you suggest, which is of deploying solar power at a scale that allows us to be able to, to, to use air conditioning. I mean, the challenge with deploying solar power at that scale is that at this point, we haven't caught up with that. Right, we haven't caught up with the ability to integrate solar power into the grid in the manner that will allow us to be able to support that level of air conditioning. And that integration is not only a question of technology, yeah. right? That integration is a question of land politics. That integration is a question of the politics of the electricity system. It's the capacity of the electricity system to be able to store. And, and that is also a technological gap at this point, right? I mean, it's one thing to be able to have, use the sun when, when the sun shines, but what do we do when the sun is not shining? Right. And we need to be able to use the energy from, um, in, you know, from someplace. And if it were a renewable source, how do we use that energy when, when you don't have that source available in abundance. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, and, and so I think again, like, you know, thinking about these questions without thinking about the systems that they are part of, um, it, it has us fall short of, of the kinds of answers and uh, that we need and the kind of world that we would like to be in. And this is where we, where you, where we also fall short in terms of our modeling studies, right? because they assume a certain technological deployment. Uh, but actually technologies don't just need to be deployed, they need to be embedded in everyday life. And, 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 and that is not straightforward and that is not catching up with the, the scale at which we're, we're moving in terms of energy consumption. Yeah, so this is why I like your work so much because I'm a philosopher and theologian and we think at the ideal level, right? And you are working at this very important juncture of built environments, infrastructure, energy systems, the political mechanisms that make certain things possible or not. And so, you know, your work, you've described how 
you know, the urbanization that has characterized Western cultures has not, you know, come up to the scale that we see now in Eastern countries where we you know so many places, India and China, urbanization is accelerating so, so quickly. So we're seeing that there are gonna be many new cities develop. That means the infrastructure needs to be built. How do you design these cities? And in your work, you've described how we don't have very good agreement amongst the many actors that could have a, a role in the decision-making process. So, you know, we've got local government, national government, we've got international bodies, we have NGOs, we have so many different, you know, entities or actors who can influence the decision-making process. So in your own experience, as you're thinking about India in particular, where new cities are going to be built, new homes are gonna be built, energy systems are gonna to need to be installed, waterworks, all these sorts of things. What's the best way to sort of create a path in which something like energy distribution is equitable, but also a higher standard of life is made possible? Is this something that happens best through government regulatory regimes? Does it happen best through market mechanisms? In your own experience, what have you seen working best in this new, new domain? Yeah, I mean, in terms of framing, I like the multiple objectives framing because it allows us to think about the priorities of different actors and these actors can be, have very different priorities. Um, whether that is clean air, clean water, crime, jobs, um, you know, all the things that individuals look for in terms of what creates a healthy life of well-being, right? Um, and, and, and often when we think about questions of climate change, we have to choose between one of these two. We have to choose between, you know, having clean air uh, locally or having coal power plants that pollute the air but provide energy and right. electricity. And those are, you know, those are fundamental choices. Um, we have to think about whether, um, you know, there should be jobs for families that don't have incomes or whether those jobs pollute the spaces that we live in. Um, the, the Delhi air example is a, is a telling one. I mean, Delhi has one of the worst air in the world now. And there are many reasons for this. Um, some of them are cars, some of them are construction. And if you think about that, right, cars for mobility, construction for shelter, um, it's also crop burning in the, in the surrounding areas for farming, which is for food, right? And so you have these different fundamental priorities of human well-being that are pitted against each other. Mm -hmm. And, and you're asking me, you know, how do we find a way through? And in policy speak, and I'm, you know, this is part of the work that I do. So I'm, you know, I do it, but I'm also sort of critical of it to the extent that, you know, we say there are multiple objectives, there are trade-offs and there are synergies. But what I was trying to ask in, in the comments that I was making before is that what is lost when we, when we use that language of trade-off and synergies. And I think in one of the, I think it was Doug's seminar where he said very, uh, you know, very sort of beautifully actually that it, you know, that when we think about trade-offs and synergies, there's almost like a, a moral claim that is lost. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that morality sort of pushes us to do better like it, it it should push us to do better but it but it doesn't when we sort of minimize everything to a trade off to a synergy to a cost to a benefit yeah. um and so i'm not answering your question because because i could i could in terms of you know sort of saying we should have deliberative processes we should have you know ways in which people come together but I frankly just don't think it's good enough in terms of how we do it. I don't think we have developed a relationship with, um, you know, with, with how we're using nature and using the natural environment um, uh, in a manner that is actually reciprocal, that is actually respectful. Um, yeah. Not just with not just with the non-human, but also with other, you know, with with the different uh, 
individuals who are impacted by those processes. Yeah, I mean, I think you're making a really important observation here. And I, I remember coming across something similar in Amitav Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement, where he talks about how the kind of conversation, which is the policy speak that happens in Paris, does not talk much in this moral way that you're describing, where we have to be able to talk about what kinds of things matter for a well-lived human life? What are the requirements for such a life? How do we live together as people, certainly, but also how we live together in ways that are uh, suitable for the mutual flourishing of human, non-human places alike? And you know, it raises, for me, a really important question about how, how do you bring these two kinds of conversations together, the moral ways of speaking and then also the policy ways of speaking, because, because it's very clear that ideological framings of like, say, neoliberalism or free market capitalism, that these are two ways of thinking about life and world that have then shaped our built environment. So that a neoliberal approach, which is all about the individual, creates a particular kind of architecture. You know, and in the United States, automobile freedom right, every person uh, doing things as they want on their own terms, right? So is it your sense that we need to be having more of this conversation in this moral sphere so we stop thinking about climate change so much as a technical problem that we develop policy fixes or technological fixes, but that we really need to spend a lot more time talking with each other in our communities, with our politicians about the moral plane of our world upon us and other communities upon us? I think we need to do both because I think, you know, I think the, the need to move in terms of actual action from uh, the a nation state perspective, from a policy perspective is essential. So we need to be able to, um, you know, to, to continue to have those policy conversations. I do think the role of morality is also really important and the conversation around it, particularly as we have that within our universities and speak to our students is essential. And I don't think we have that one enough. Um, I think, and, and so I would say that the space that we occupy and the privilege that we occupy in terms of being able to think about these questions in the abstract um, and be able to, to teach about them there, you know, that, that is where I would emphasize the need to think about uh, the, the moral claim of these questions a lot more. Having said that, you know, I still don't have a good way to think about how the, you know, where the morality of the, the burden or the responsibility of climate change fits into all this. Um, because that's a different kind of moral question, but it's not, you know, I don't think we can separate the uh, you know the morality of these two questions. I think it's important to think about them together. And I haven't you know I I I haven't seen a conversation that does that well. Yeah. So just a reminder to webinar participants that if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A function. We'll get to them shortly. So let, let's just pick up on that a little bit more. Um, you know, I I also when I talk with colleagues, whether in the university or beyond. I find that it's so difficult to bring up the moral question. There is a, a, a desire to think that we could do a technological fix or a policy change that will, that will just solve the problems and that perhaps quality of life doesn't need to be on the table. And, and we have to be very careful here because you know, whose quality of life are we talking about in particular? So when you talk about environmentalism as you experience and work in the spaces in India, they're so different than what they are in this country, for instance, where you know we've got a standard of we, again, who is the we, but so many people have a standard of life, which is unimaginable. And your, your graph early on in the presentation about emissions per person is so instructive in this regard. So would the point be that people in the European Union or people in North America they need to have a different conversation about morality than say people in India or people in China. I mean, how, how do you see this? Because you know, you, you've got experience working in both worlds. Do you see that the conversations need to be quite different depending on where you are? 
yeah they, I, I i do think they do and i think it's very i don't i don't think that we can forget the historical responsibility that lies with uh with countries and that therefore translates to individuals within those countries uh for you know for better or worse and and perhaps without choice uh but but that is a burden that we carry as mm -hmm. individuals within certain countries um having said that i think you know the the whole conversation around lifestyles and this is a, this is a new it's it's new in the climate debate you know it's um the ipcc has a chapter for the first time in the upcoming uh, assessment report on sort of social aspects of mitigation the unep gap report has a had, had the chapter on lifestyles for the first time so this it's it is um, like well, for many, this is a conversation, you know, it's, it's not a topic that is new, but in the in the kind of climate discourse, it is something that we're thinking about for the first time in a um, in a theoretical sense, in a in an intellectual sense about where what is the role that we play as individuals? Maybe technology cannot solve everything. Maybe there's a role for behavior. Maybe there's a role for culture, right? And trying to bring that in to to the conversation around modelers and modeling. And now we're modeling lifestyle change, which is also very interesting. Um, but what that tells us is actually that the richest 1% of the world's population um, is responsible for the same amount of emissions or as the lowest 50%. And that is not, and 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 so that question of income level, right, is uh, is not only tied to countries. That's actually disparity within countries as well that shows up. So I think again, when we're having this conversation, it's not just about historical responsibility. It's also about current and present ways of living and the responsibility that lies with the lifestyle that we have. Whether we're flying all the time or whether we, you know, have never ridden in a car, and 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 so that so the conversation needs to be different even within countries. You know, it's it's to say that like everybody who's in a country with low capita emissions, you know, that shouldn't mask the variation that happens within a certain space. Yeah, good. Let's let's go to a question from our, our participants. As we talk about a moral shift in how we should view and build the world. How much of that should be centered on changing or possibly moving on from capitalism? Is the e EU and the US or in these two places, should we talk about degrowth and perhaps even reparations? Or do we simply need the investment in capital that capitalism provides for a transition into a greener world? Just a small I mean, question. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, because of the work that I do and the focus on thinking through actual solutions, and and I, it's it's hard for me to focus on too much on questions of degrowth in terms of a realistic uh, outcomes-based approach, and 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 so I actually think a shift within current structures, current institutions, current politics is is more likely. And, and more practical than one where we do away with all of this altogether. Mm -hmm. And also it, it is a question of timing, right? Are we really going to be able to be in a world where we, um, you know, where we move away from this capitalistic order in the time scale that is needed? Like, you know, we're at 1.18 degrees of temperature increase already. If we want to get to 1.5, we're looking at the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years maximum right. in terms of our current path. And personally, it's, it, you know, I, I am much more focused on how we can do that given, you know, given what is possible within, within our current structures. And yeah. degrowth for me is also, you know, it's, it's hard for me to think of that in a context where many, many millions and, you know, of people still don't have access to electricity, mm -hmm. still don't have access to, you know, the basic things that determine quality of life, where energy is, is sort of central to providing them. Mm 
Um, and and so I'm very much focused on questions of growth and development, while at the same time being able to preserve and enhance the environment. Or is this a situation where perhaps degrowth is appropriate in some parts of the world versus other parts, right? So that we would want to stimulate, you know, clean forms of energy production in certain parts of the world, whereas putting a strategy of radically de um, de-emphasizing energy production in other parts of the world will be important to do. But possibly, but again, you know, um, just looking at those IPCC scenarios, the, the, the two ways in which we can get to global temperature targets, one of them requires negative emission scenarios, and then the other way is to change our lifestyles. And systematically around the world, we are focusing on investing in negative emission scenarios. Um, you know, these are technologies we don't have to scale. They're not financially viable. We're not willing to look at shifting our lifestyles and shifting the way, our, uh, you know, the way we currently operate. And so in, in theory, I, I think what you're saying is, you know, it's, it's a good option, but, um, but I don't see it practically playing out. And so I'm much more interested actually in how we can do the harder work of working with the systems that we have right now and shifting those um, as opposed to completely shutting down production or, you know, or, or, or consumption in, in, in a particular area. I think it's much more about managing that as opposed to getting rid of it altogether. Thank you. Another question, the community of our young people speak out about climate change through climate strikes and demonstrations, and they have a role to play in our local and national communities, but essentially they are generally tolerated or patronized. How can the global policy structures take more seriously the voice of young people? I mean, I would not, you know, I would not be so negative about um, the the role of young people, the role of civil society striking. I think, um, I think the the climate conversation has changed, and it's changed for the better um, with the climate strikes that we saw over the over the last you know year or two. And um, what to me was very striking about those images is that the images looked almost identical from around the world. You know, the strikes in Berlin looked the same as the strikes in Oxford. They looked the same as the strikes in, in, um, in Chennai. And it kind of did away with that, um, you know, that, that kind of early categorization in the climate debate about developed and developing. Instead, you just had young people who, uh, you know, for the most part, young people who were demanding for a, a better future. And, and I do think that that has shifted the climate conversation. And the other thing I will say is that the negotiations for the first time are also um, recognizing the role of non-state actors. And, you know, there, there is sort of an official space for them now within the negotiations. And that is probably all likely to grow. So I would not think, I would not say that actually there isn't a role for non-state actors, including young people. Actually that role is growing and that role has seen more space than ever before. And, and, and it's likely to, to, to continue given the traction that it's had, um, you know, at the global level and at the national level. Yeah. So my experience, which is not extensive, but it seems to me that what younger people are bringing to the table is precisely the question of lifestyle. Right? What is an appropriate lifestyle for human beings to have? And I'm, I'm wondering about your own experience. Do you sense that people who are, are young people who are bringing these concerns about, about climate and species extinction and so forth, do they see a different set of priorities in their activism that perhaps tilt more to transformation of economy different built environment, more concern about justice and equity than, you know, the early phases of environmentalism in this country, which were so much about wilderness preservation. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, in that sense, it's a, a you know, it, it's a much more contemporary view to, uh, you know, to what needs to be done. And also a sort of, um, you know, a willingness to shift how one, uh, how one lives. 
which I think, which I think, you know, young people demonstrate much more than the rest of us. Um, I'm actually really, you know, surprised in a in a very pleasant way at the the sort of particularly the shift to vegetarianism. Um, and I, I see it a lot actually at Oxford, how young folks are, you know, they're, they're vegetarian for the environment. They're vegetarian because of climate change. Um, and and that, is in a, that is, you know, it's a, it's a willingness to shift how you live and how you consume for, you know, to shift your relationship with the earth. Um, and, and, and so I think that is actually, um, it's example for, for many of us, but it's, if it grows, it would grow bottom up, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a sort of top down type of uh, shift that we're willing, that we're, that we're seeing. And that's nice. It's nice to see that bottom up movement. Um, but the, you know, as I look at that temperature graph ticking, you know, it, I wonder whether it will be enough. Yeah. So Bill McKibben has said that it's not about personal virtue or vice, because even if you decide to go vegan and you convince, say, 10 of your best friends to go vegan at the same time, it's not going to move quickly enough to make the changes that are necessary. And this is, again, where I think your focus on built environments and infrastructures is so important because the infrastructures we inhabit almost lock in a moral way of being. And, and a question from our, our participants is, when we think about um, the moral voice, what about the religious voice? Do you see in the places where you work, where spiritual traditions or religious traditions come up as a source of authority for thinking differently about questions of human lifestyle, but also questions about what an economy economy or a political system should be for, because we know that in many faith traditions, there's a kind of reverence for the world and the sacredness of life that has been eclipsed in more instrumental utilitarian ways of thinking about our planet and our life together. Have you seen that religious voices can play a role in these kinds of conversations or are they pretty much absent? So to be honest, I've not seen that in a way that, um, that has been, you know, too instructive. I've, I've not, I haven't come across that. And my own experience here is actually, um, you know, seeing those, those voices being quite, um, quite at ends with the, with the kind of questions of modernity and development. So not really engaging with them head on, but rather, um, you know, sort of, it, it, calling out to our relationship with the natural environment in a manner that is that is not engaged with our contemporary consumption patterns and um and 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 so they are not able to speak to each other mm. um and so we end up in that same tension between growth development and the environment yeah um and and actually i think the voice of um you know religious voices could be very useful in trying to bridge that. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen that. I wonder if you have in, yeah, in, in the it's, places it's where you work. Yeah, in some places where I've been, for instance, um, I know that in this country, when you work with elected officials, sometimes a religious voice as a kind of impetus for change is received with some power it actually has some influence over elected officials. But I know in other parts of the world that um, this is not a voice that is needed or even desired. And so I think there are lots of regional variations. And you know, living where I do here in the Southeast of the United States, sometimes called the Bible Belt, um, there's often an assumption that you know, a Christian or a Protestant or Catholic way of speaking about the world would have some traction. But as you say, it's not always clear that the conversation proceeds along a way that is resonant with the kinds of situations, the kinds of issues that are most pressing for us. I want to pose one more question for you. Given your work in, in India and in cities and infrastructure built environments, if you could make one recommendation uh, to, to help us chart a better future for people in India, 
what would that be? I, I, you know, I'd go beyond India. I, 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 it's really about thinking about when the built environment is conceptualized and put together for the first time. I mean, I just think it is such a unique moment um, when places are being built to be able to shape behaviors, to be able to shape institutions, to be able to shape materials. Um, and materiality and and using that moment given the transitions that a large part of the world is currently seeing because a large part of the world is currently still being built mm -hmm. that is really our time to be able to um, think through a solution space that particularly focuses on the residential on mobility and on the provision of food because these are the three things that cut across our everyday life and our well-being and climate mitigation. Thank you so much, Radhika. That was very helpful and so much enjoyed our conversation. And we now need to bring this to a close. So thank you to our webinar participants and a reminder that next week, our guest will be Willis Jenkins from University of Virginia. So thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Radhika, and best wishes to you all for a great day.